minutes. All right, so I'm going to set this thing. I have to remind that the screen <laughs> shows you. It does it show me. me. That's Go right. Here. Yes. Okay. Um, we're going to go ahead and begin. And if you have your hymnal, we're going to turn to hymn 566 to begin tonight because the um, really the theme for both of the articles that we're going to be studying tonight is the sufficiency of Christ. It is that he has uh, accomplished everything for our salvation and there is nothing we need to add to it. There is nothing that we need to do in addition to that for our salvation. So uh, I thought we could start by singing a little bit. So if you have your hymnal, hymn 566, by grace I'm saved, and let's give it a go here. All right. Give Patricia just a second to find it, though. <laughs> All right. By grace I'm saved, grace free and boundless. My soul believe and doubt it not. Why stagger at this word of promise? Has scripture ever falsehood taught? No, then this word must true remain. By grace you too will life obtain. By grace none dare lay claim to merit. Our works and conduct have no worth. God in his love sent our Redeemer, Christ Jesus to this sinful earth. His death did for our sins atone, and we are saved by grace alone. By grace God's Son, our only Savior, came down to earth to bear our sin. Was it because of your own merit that Jesus died your soul to win. No, it was grace and grace alone that brought him from his heavenly throne. By grace this ground of faith is certain. As long as God is true, it stands. What saints have penned by inspiration, what God in his world can mend, our faith in what our God has done depends on grace, grace through his Son. By grace to timid hearts that tremble, in tribulations furnace try, thy grace in spite of fear and trouble, the Father's heart is open wide, where could I help and strength secure, if grace were not my anchor sure? By grace on this I'll rest when dying. In Jesus' promise I rejoice. For though I know my heart's condition, I also know my Savior's voice. My heart is glad all grief has flown. Since I am saved by grace alone. All right, so uh, tonight we are looking at the Augsburg Confession, Articles uh, 25, 26. And the reason that we are doing these kind of as a combined study tonight is partially because we already looked at confession uh, earlier in the Augsburg Confession. And because the same theme runs through both of these, and that is the sufficiency of Christ. So 
when we think about what Jesus has done for us on the cross, how many of our sins has he paid for? All of them, right? The little kids, they know that, right? All of them. So if he's paid for all of them, what part is left for you? There is none. <laughs> it's already paid in full, right? So then where do things like confession come in? Where do things like um, fasting come in? Do they add to the work of Christ? Well, they don't, but the problem is that uh, idea that, well, if you're doing these things, there must be a reason that you're doing them to contribute something. That kind of crept into the church. And that became more and more the way of thinking for a lot of people. And that was part of what the Reformation was there to try to clean up, was the idea that you had to do your part in addition to what Jesus has done for you. And so they start to look at confession as, rather than a, a means of grace, as a work that you must do in order to merit grace. As if you could merit grace, but anyway. Uh, and fasting, rather than seeing it as a way of disciplining the body so that you continue to live in the holiness that God would have you live in, they see it as meritorious for becoming holy and gaining salvation. So those things are not bad, right? Confession is not bad, it's good. Fasting, that's not bad, it's good, right? Fasting, fasting and bodily preparation are indeed fine outward training. Our catechism says that very thing, right? But they don't actually contribute to your salvation in any way, shape, or form. Okay, so let's take a look at confession first, Article 25. And the way we're going to do it tonight, we're just going to, as we go through it, we're going to talk about it because especially, um, especially Article 26 is kind of lengthy. But it also basically just walks you through all of the arguments, like the earlier ones where you look at Article 4 or Article 5, like they're pretty short and I have to pull in all kinds of stuff. They did the work for me, so I don't have to do any of that with these. Uh, or not much. We'll do a, just a little bit of review on, on confession. Okay? So, oh, I went too far. All right, Article 25. Confession in the churches is not abolished among us. The body of the Lord is not usually given to those who have not been examined and absolved. The people are very careful about faith in the absolution. Before, there was profound silence about faith. Our people are taught that they should highly prize the absolution as being God's voice pronounced by God's command. All right, so mostly this is review right here, isn't it? So we already talked about confession. It's not abolished. We haven't done away with that. Private confession and absolution still retained. Not only that, we also have public confession and absolution that we do as part of the service every single Sunday, right? We have the invocation, and the very next thing, the very first thing that we're going to do is what? We're going to say, yeah, I'm a rotten sinner, and I need God's forgiveness. And then you hear the absolution. Now, the absolution is spoken by who? By the pastor, but who's really speaking? It's really the voice of Jesus, isn't it? It's the voice of Jesus through the office of holy ministry. And he is saying, your sins are forgiven, right? And are they? Yeah. Okay. And, and so also we have here the uh, remi reminder that this is by faith, right? It's not just by going through the motions. It is by faith in the words of Christ. All right, so the power of the keys is set forth in its beauty. 
they are reminded what great consolation it brings to anxious consciences that God requires faith to believe such absolution as a voice sounding from heaven. They are taught that such faith in Christ truly obtains and receives the forgiveness of sins. Before satisfactions were praised without restraint, and little was said about faith, Christ's merit, and the righteousness of faith. All right, so they're, they're laying out here, okay? We haven't done away with confession, uh, but we are teaching what it actually is and does and means. So before satisfactions were praised without restraint, meaning you do your penance after hearing the words of forgiveness and then you merit that forgiveness. And little was said about Christ's merit and faith and the righteousness of faith. So which would be more important? Being told after you receive the, uh, those words of forgiveness, now here's what you do in order to earn forgiveness or knowing Actually, here's what Christ has done for you. And by believing it, this forgiveness is yours. Well, it's pretty obvious, right? So the, the keys are given not in order to bind people to more works, but to set them free in Christ. Therefore, on this point, our churches are by no means to be blamed even our adversaries have to concede the point that our teachers have diligently taught the doctrine of repentance and laid it open. All right, so we've, we've taught about this. This is nothing new. Our churches teach that naming every sin is not necessary and that consciences should not be burdened with worry about naming every sin. It is impossible to recount all sins. As Psalm 19 verse 12 said, uh, testifies, who can discern his errors? Also, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? So, what would be the issue if your forgiveness were dependent on you naming every single sin? You're going to miss something. <laughs> Or a lot, yeah. Because you're like, oh my goodness, I keep pulling on this thread and it just keeps going, right? Because the once you start tracing, it, it, it is endless. So by the time you get done and you think you've named them all, you've still probably forgotten a whole bunch. But even if you did name them all, now there's going to be more immediately following this. But isn't it all right if I forget to name my venial sins as long as I name all the mortal ones? Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, so here's the idea. Grace is not a burden. <laughs> Grace is good and freeing and liberating, right? So you don't have to wonder, have I named every single sin? Because that's not the standard. Right? So you name those sins that you, you know and are, are maybe really kind of the big obvious things that you're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I did this thing again. Uh, and those things that are really burdening you. But then you, you know there's a whole bunch more. And you say, Lord, and forgive me for all of that stuff too. Right? You know all of my sin. And I ask your forgiveness. And God says, what? Your sins are forgiven. Right? If only sins that can be named are forgiven, consciences could never find peace. Isn't that true? If, if, sins, if only sins that can be named are forgiven, consciences could never find peace because you'd never know. Have I named all the sins, right? Have I done all of the things that are necessary? For many sins cannot be seen or remembered, <laughs> right? So this is what we were saying before, right? There's a lot of things that you've done that you know are sinful. And there's a lot of things that you've done that you don't even think about are sinful, right? The ancient writers testify that a listing of sins is not necessary for in the decrees, Chrysostom is quoted. He says, 
I did not say that you should make your sins known in public, nor that you should accuse yourself before others. But I would have you obey the prophet who says, make known your ways before God. Therefore, confess your sins before God, the true judge, with prayer. Tell your errors, not with the tongue, but with the memory of your conscience and so forth. And the gloss admits that confession is of human right only. Nevertheless, because of the great benefit of absolution and because it otherwise is useful to the conscience, confession is retained among us. In other words, uh, you, we can't force somebody to go to private confession and absolution. That's not the standard God has given us, right? It's a gift. It's there. It's available for you. It is a way that you can receive the, the forgiveness of sins. So you can know the grace of God. You can have your conscience unburdened. But it, it's not a burden placed upon you that you must go and confess your sins or you can't receive forgiveness, right? Do you have to confess your sins to your pastor directly? But if there's a sin that's bothering you, is that available? Yeah. So again, this is gift, not burden. Okay. All right, just a quick review of, of how this works, right? So the merit of Christ upon the cross, all sins, all time, paid for in full. He delivers that forgiveness of sins to us through the word of God, through the holy baptism, through holy communion, and through absolution. And he uses the office of holy ministry as the way by which those things are delivered. Okay? This is just the way God has established it. All right, and a quick review of confession. So there's two parts, right? We confess our death. We confess our sin. And then... God gives life through forgiveness of sins. So confession always has two parts. You confess and you receive absolution. Your sins are forgiven. Often when we use the word confession, we refer just to the first part, our agreeing with God about our sinfulness. When we do, the second part is properly called absolution. All right. What sins to confess? And this is the, a good, a good uh, principle for us here, the may-must principle. We must confess all our sins to God. We confess those remembered specifically and the rest with general words of confession, right? Just about what we talked about before. And we may confess any sin to a pastor or... You can also confess to a brother or sister in Christ, right? This is uh, one of the, the gifts God has given that, yes, you can speak forgiveness as well, right? Okay. Now, how do you examine yourself? How do you know where, what sin is? What's the measuring stick? Well, it's not um, arbitrary. It's not your own feelings. It's what? God's law, right? Ten Commandments. So you walk through the Ten Commandments, you reflect upon that, you see where you have fallen short, and that reveals your sin, right? This is the second use of the law, right? You remember the three uses of the law? First use functions as a, what? Curb. The law curbs evil, restrains evil, so that we don't have just a society going nuts. Well, it is going nuts, but just imagine if God's law wasn't there, how much further gone everything would be, right? Okay, so curb, a mirror, that's the second use, shows us our sin. It's diagnostic, right? Shows you where you have sinned and need forgiveness. And the third use of the law is as a, what? A guide. A gu it guides us in godly living. Now that you have been forgiven, now that you've come to faith in Christ, how does God want you to live? And you seek to do that. Okay, uh, another good way of thinking through this is your vocations, your roles in life that God has given you. 
And where have you fallen short? Where do you need forgiveness? Okay, the good news is that confessed sin by God's grace is forgiven sin. All right, on to the distinction of meats. I like to distinguish between meats because they're all delicious, uh, but that's, uh, that's another matter. Um, all right, not only the people, but also the, those teaching in the churches have generally been persuaded to believe in making distinctions between meats and similar human traditions. They believe these are useful works for meriting grace and are able to make satisfaction for sins. Okay, what's the problem right there? If I don't eat bacon, you won't forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the Pharisees with Jesus, with their own traditions, right? Well, you don't wash your hands the way that our tradition says you su you're supposed to. So that's bad. Well, says who? <laughs> uh, but it's, it's worse than that. It's worse than that because not only is it putting laws in place and saying you must abide by these laws, but it's also saying, here are the laws that are in place and not only must you abide by them, but if you don't do that, you're not meriting grace. You're not getting your way to heaven. You are going to be in the deficit, right? So it's, what is it doing? It's stealing from Jesus. It's stealing from the work of Jesus. From this, there developed the view that new ceremonies, new orders, new holy days, and new fastings were instituted daily. Teachers in the church were required these works as necessary service to merit grace. They greatly terrified God's people's, uh, people's consciences when they left any of these things out. Because of this viewpoint, the church has suffered great damage. All right, so they set up new rules, right? You, you have to fast on this day. You can eat meat on this day, but not on this day. Uh, if you won't join this holy order, then you merit more grace. And so uh, what it does is it sets up church people do these things, and they are better than the ordinary people who do these things. So being a father, mother, a husband, wife, a son, daughter, a, a worker, well, those... Those are, those are kind of down here. But if you become a monk or a priest or a nun, well, now you're elevated up here. And so you're, you're doing better things, more important things than the ordinary people. Yep. Locking yourself away in order to avoid having to love your neighbor? <laughs> Some days it's tempting. <laughs> okay. Um, but then it also puts a burden on people because they're, they're saying, well, okay, what are all of the rules that I have to follow? And if I'm not following those rules, am I endangering my soul? Right? This is not the freedom of the gospel. This is not the, the peace that Christ came to bring. This is burdening people with additional things. All right, so we're going to kind of walk through, and, and they lay out here for us, um, I believe, three different objections, right? So first, the chief part of the gospel, the doctrine of grace and of the righteousness of faith has been obscured by this view. This is maybe the worst of the, uh, the, the problems here. So the gospel should stand out as the most prominent teaching in the church in order that Christ's merit may be well known and faith which believes that sins are forgiven for Christ's sake may be exalted far above works. That's really good right there, isn't it? The gospel should stand out as the most prominent teaching in the church. What should Christians be known for? Above and beyond anything else, the gospel. Because 
that's about Jesus, <laughs> right? In order that Christ's merit may be made well known. Not, not our merit, not our good works. Christ's merit may be no, well known. And faith, which believes that sins are forgiven for Christ's sake, may be exalted above works. All right, which is more important, faith or works? Well, here's the deal. Works only follow faith. Good works, truly good works, only follow faith. So we need faith first, and then good works will follow. I believe we already saw that in our confessions. It said that very thing. Good works will come from faith. Okay? Yep. So, do you think that... We get into this argument kind of often at home because um, we're in the Augsburg Confession, or not Augsburg, <laughs> the Athanasian Creed, it, it, it talks mm -hmm. about the people who have done good right, and, and the people who have done evil will be presumed to eternal freedom. So, do you think that, the, is, that is, is that vine branches, just that, that whole imagery that we have up on the lecture and all, all of that? Do you think sufficiently taught in our churches? Or do you think that, like, Lutherans beat it to death, or do you think we don't say it enough, or do you think it kind of depends? Or what? I think it depends, right? It depends, you know, church to church and situation to situation. But uh, anytime we use the Athanasian Creed, I try to make a point of saying, what does that mean, right? Because uh, it could be easily misunderstood by people to think, okay, um, it says right there that I'm saved by my good works. That's not what it's saying, right? Good works will come from those who have been made good. This is the tree and branches thing, right? A good tree cannot produce uh, bad fruit and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. And so we have to be made good by Jesus and then the good works will follow. Um, but when we try to put the cart before the horse, when we try to put works before faith, what happens? We focus on the works. We're not focusing on Jesus. Uh, everything starts to fall apart. You see how it, it, it just keeps going back to the person and work of Jesus and justification. <laughs> everything keeps going back right to that. If you know exactly who Jesus is, what he has done, and you understand justification is by faith in him, Everything else can flow from that. You can get it right. If you misunderstand either of those, what's going to happen? Your foundation will be wrong. Everything that flows from it's going to be off. Okay. All right. Um, therefore, Paul also lays the greatest stress on this article, putting aside the law in human traditions, in order that Christian righteousness is something other than such works. Christian righteousness is the faith that believes that sins are forgiven freely for Christ's sake. There's article four right there. <laughs> That's article four of the uh, uh, Augsburg Confession. But the doctrine of Paul has been almost completely smothered by traditions, which have produced the opinion that we must merit grace and righteousness by making distinctions in meats and similar services. In other words, Jesus did his part. Now, we got all these rules now that we're going to give you, and you have to do those things, and then you can be righteous. Okay, so they're obscuring the work of Jesus. And never a good idea to put something between people and Jesus, right? This, this is robbing Jesus of his glory. This is uh, putting people's focus on something other than Christ and his saving work. When repentance was taught, there was no mention of faith. Only works of satisfaction were set forth. And so repentance seemed to stand entirely on these works. In other words, you go in and you confess your sins, right? And you're told what? Do these things, and you are right with God. 
Now, is that what Jesus gave us to do? Well, no. John chapter 20, Jesus breathed on his disciples and he said what? Whoever sins, you forgive, they are forgiven. So, uh, we're, we're again driving people back to their works, not to Christ. Yep. Yeah, they are, but, but, if, but if the person in authority that claims to be speaking for God tells you, here's what you do, then you're going to probably believe that, right? Which is, which is why the, the uh, greater uh, sin is on the behalf of the church there. Okay, second... Second big point here. These traditions have hindered God's commandments because traditions were placed far above God's commandments. Christianity has taught to stand wholly on the observance of holy days. It was taught uh, to stand wholly on the observance of holy days, rites, fasts, and vestments. These observances won the exalted title of spiritual life and the perfect life. Meanwhile, God's commandments, according to each one's vocation or calling, were without honor. <laughs> that just sums it up really, really well. So uh, the church told you, okay, you have to come to church on these specific days and observe these holy days in these given ways. And uh, you have to fast at these times and in these ways. And Oh, hey, if we put these specific outfits on the priests, now they're holier than you, right? Now, are vestments bad? No, we, we still have them. Do, does placing a vestment on me make me better than you? No, it's just a way of signifying what I'm there to do and to be about. Um, if we didn't have them, well, that, that, would, that, that could be okay too. We could we could be the church without those things, right? Why did we keep them? Well, because they communicate. But we got to teach what they communicate, right? We can't just be like, well, he, of course he's holier. Look at what he's wearing. I mean, that's, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay, but it's also saying what? Church stuff up here and the rest of your life down here, all right? So if you're not a church worker, I'm sorry, you're just never going to be as holy as the rest of us that are. Well, that's just not how it is, right? This is just not true. This is, uh, this is setting things up um, in, a, in a faulty way. So these works include a father raising his children, a mother bearing children, a prince governing the commonwealth. These were considered to be worldly and thus imperfect works, far below the glittering observance of the church. This error greatly tormented people without, uh, with devout consciences. So, you know, people are like, well, I, I'm, I'm just a father. I'm just a mother. Uh, I work for the government, man. It's like, okay, yeah, great. We need that. Be a good father. Be a good mother, right? Be a good government worker. Do what God has given you well, and that's God-pleasing. In the same way that if I do my job well, that's going to be God-pleasing. Which is better? Well, what has God given you to do? If you do that, that's better, right? It's, it would not be better for you if you are a husband to be like, well... Um, I want to become a priest and you have to be, uh, you can't be married if you're a priest. So I'm going to go leave my family and go do this thing. Cause that's holier. No, now that's sin. <laughs> You've just left your family. That's what we call sin, right? Uh, it would not be good for a prince who is ruling at, you know, doing the, the role of government there to be like, well, I want to do something holy though. So I'm going to, I'm going to. Resign from this so that I can go and become a monk. Well, now you have 
given up the responsibility that God has placed upon you for some other thing that you've chosen for yourself. Uh, so we need to, rather than pit these things against each other, teach the, the blessing that God gives through all of these different vocations and that they are all good and holy. The grieved that they uh, were held in an imperfect, or they grieved, I should say, that they were held in an imperfect state of life, as in marriage, in the honor, or the office of ruler, or in other civil services. They admired the monks, that these and others liked them. They falsely taught that these people's observances were more acceptable to God. Okay, again. The works that God has given you to do are not the same thing necessarily that God has given me to do. So just do the things God's given you, and that's good and right and holy. No less than, no more than, if I do the things God has given me to do, right? Third, traditions brought great danger to consciences. It was impossible to keep all traditions, and yet... People considered these observances to be necessary acts of worship. Gerson writes that many fell into despair and even took their own lives because they felt that they were not able to satisfy the traditions. All the while, they had never heard about the consoling righteousness of faith and grace. We see that academics and theologians gathered the traditions and seek ways to relieve and ease consciences. Now, who is Gerson? I don't know. I had some, nobody I had ever heard of. So uh, in the if you have your book of Concord, you can go to the back and on page uh, 714 in the index, it tells you a little bit about him. I looked it up because I was like, I don't know, who's Gerson, right? It says, Chancellor at University of Paris, uh, 1395. Drawn to the problem of papal schism, Gerson influenced the councils of Pisa and Constance. Uh, hostility kept Gerson from returning to France. He spent time in Bavaria and Austria and, continued, and concluded his life in pastoral and literary activities at Lyon, France. His chief concern was that people, both educated and simple, would tr live truly pious lives. He has spoken... He uh, has been spoken of as a pre-reformer, but held that for salvation, man must do what was what is with what is in him. In other words, he identified this problem, but he didn't necessarily have the right solution. <laughs> he was still driving people back to their works. But the reason they bring this guy up is to say, "See, this problem isn't anything new." You already had somebody a hundred years ago saying the same thing. They do not free consciences enough, but sometimes entangle them even more. The schools and sermons have been so occupied with gathering these traditions that they do not even have enough leisure time to touch on scripture. That sounds like a Luther line, not a Melanchthon line, I tell you. <laughs> The, the sarcasm coming through a little bit. That is definitely something you would expect from Luther, not from Melanchthon. Uh, they do not per, uh, pursue the far more useful doctrine of faith, the cross, hope, and the dignity of secular affairs, and consolation for severely tested consciences. So hopefully, hopefully, we're talking about those things here. At hope, right? The doctrine of faith, the cross, hope, the dignity of secular affairs. What do we call that more often? Vocation, right? And consolation for severely tested consciences, which is found where? In Jesus. Therefore, Gerson and some other theologians have complained Sadly, that because of all of this striving after traditions, they were prevented from giving attention to a better kind of doctrine. 
Augustine forbids that people's consciences should be burdened. He prudently advises uh, Januarius that he must know that they are to be observed as things neither commanded by God nor forbidden, for such are his words. In other words, we have during the time of Lent, a time of fasting. Okay. Do you have to fast during that time? No. But we might set that up as a time of fasting. Why? Because it's a good time to say, okay, I'm going to discipline my body so that I can uh, reflect on the Lord. I can walk in his ways. I can put my focus on Jesus. Uh, but it, it, never thinking this is meriting more grace, more favor from God. But rather, I'm just trying to make sure that I'm focused on the things that are of most importance. Therefore, our teachers must be regarded as having taken up this matter, uh, must not be regarded as having taken up this matter rashly or from hatred of the bishops as some falsely suspected. That there was a great need to warn the churches of these errors that arose from misunderstanding the traditions. The gospel compels us to insist on the doctrine of grace and the righteousness of faith in the churches. This cannot be understood if people think that they merit grace by observances of their own choice. So we're going to talk more about Jesus than your works because Jesus is more important. <laughs> He actually merits grace for you. Your good works don't, right? I think we just sang about that, right? <laughs> our works and conduct have no worth. Uh, so our churches have taught that we cannot merit grace or be justified by observing human traditions. We must not think that such observances are necessary acts of worship. Here we add testimonies of scripture. Christ defends the apostles who had not observed the usual tradition. This had to do with a matter that was not unlawful, but rather neither commanded nor forbidden. It was similar to purification of the law. By the way, what's the term that we have for something that is neither commanded nor forbidden? Adiaphora, right? Adiaphora doesn't mean do whatever you want to do, necessarily. It means God has not said you must or you may not, right? There still can be maybe um, things that within, within that scope of what's better, right? What's going to be more helpful, uh, but it's not commanded nor forbidden. He said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the doctrines of the commandments of men. Therefore, he does not require a useless human service. Shortly after, he adds, It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. <laughs> In other words, it's not the food that you eat, right? It's the heart within that is going to manifest itself in certain works. So you don't become holy by... Um, doing certain works and not doing other works, you become holy when you are made holy by Jesus. And then works will follow. A good tree will produce good fruit. Yep. So I guess there is then a case to be not a case to be made for not eating rotten meat so that what comes out of the mouth after <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> All right. So also Paul in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's a great verse right there, isn't it? The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And in Colossians 2, 16, let no one pass judgment on you in, a question, in questions of food and drink or with regard to a Sabbath. And again, if, with Christ, you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Colossians is real clear. These things don't do a thing for your salvation. It's all done in Jesus. 
Peter says, Why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. Here, Peter forbids bur burdening consciences with many rights, either from Moses or others. So, Gentiles were coming to faith, and some of the Jews were wanting to say, cool, we'll welcome you as Christians, but you have to observe all of the Old Testament commandments, the laws of Moses, right? Not the laws of God that are eternal, not the, the moral law of God as summarized in the Ten Commandments, but things like not eating pork and um, you know, not uh, working on the Sabbath and things like that, not working on, the, on Saturday specifically, right? And, and so they're trying to say, well, you have to keep all of these laws. And Peter here says, um, nope, <laughs> that's not how it is. We are free from all of those things in Jesus. In 1 Timothy 4, Paul calls the prohibition of meats a teaching of demons. It is contrary to the gospel to institute or do such works, thinking that we merit grace through them. Or... As, through, as though Christianity could not exist without such service of God. Okay. Our adversaries object by accusing our teachers of being against discipline and the subduing of the flesh. All right? So they're like, oh, you guys don't think fasting has any use whatsoever, do you? Uh, just the opposite is true as can be learned from our teacher's writings. <laughs> like that. It's, this, is like, this is, again, a little bit of sarcasm sneaking in, I think. Like, hey, maybe if you guys read what we wrote, you would actually know what we teach. Uh, they have always taught Christians are to bear the cross by enduring afflictions. This is genuine and sincere subduing of the flesh, to be crucified with Christ through various afflictions. Furthermore, they teach that every Christian ought to gladly uh, ought to train and subdue himself with bodily restraints or bodily exercises and labors. Then neither overindulgence nor laziness may tempt him to sin. But they do not teach that we may merit grace or make satisfaction for sins by such exercises. Such outward discipline ought to be taught at all times, not only on a few set days. So, you're like, yeah, no, bodily training is good. It just doesn't merit grace. <laughs> it doesn't earn you salvation. It doesn't cr contribute to your salvation. Christ commands, watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness. Also, Matthew 17, 21, this kind never comes out except by prayer and fasting. Paul also says, I discipline my body and keep it under control. Here he clearly shows that he was keeping his body under control, not to merit forgiveness of sins by that discipline, but to keep his body prepared for spiritual things, for carrying out the duties of his calling. There, that's a really good line right there. Why might you consider fasting? To keep your body prepared for spiritual things, for carrying out the duties of your calling. That's, that's a really good way of putting it, right? Why do you not overindulge in food or in drink or uh, in sleep or in recreation? Well, because I need to make sure that I am disciplining my body to be prepared for spiritual things. Therefore, we do not condemn fasting in itself, but certain traditions that require certain days and certain meals with peril of conscience as though such works were a necessary service. Nevertheless, we keep many traditions that are leading to good order in the church, such as the order of scripture lessons in the mass and the chief holy days. All right, so we do keep some of the traditions, right? In fact, the Lutherans, as we've talked about, the Lutheran Reformation was a conservative reformation. We kept Everything we could that wasn't contrary to scripture, unlike the Radical Reformation, where they threw everything out and said, we're going to start from scratch and figure this all out on our own. We were like, no, there's a lot of people who came before us that were a lot 
that had a lot of, a, a lot of uh, wisdom. Maybe we shouldn't just get rid of all of that. Maybe we can benefit from that. Why do you think that it seems to be so difficult to shall we play that balancing act? Because it seems like it's very easy to A, get vilified by people that either say, you're not keeping everything or you're not keeping enough of it. Right. And then it winds up being that often people go and attribute <laughs> habits and things that we do as laws that we're following instead of good practices. Yeah. And, how, like, and, and if you try to answer somebody instead of, hey, this is what the faith actually is about, it doesn't fit into 140 characters or less, so people lose the patience to even hear about it in the second, in this first place. So it's like, how do you, how do you even? Yeah, I think to do this. I think um, part of uh, so yeah, so there's two ditches, right? There's the ditch of we're throwing everything out and doing our own thing, or well, we have to keep all of the things that have been passed down, and if you're not keeping all of those things, then somehow you're doing wrong. So, for for instance, you know. Things like vestments, right? We have them, but if we were to go without them, it would not be sin, right? So the the gospel freedom has to be elevated above traditions. Uh, but then we also have to have the humility to be able to say, well, Let's not get rid of something just because we don't understand it or because um, we think we have some better way. We better, we better be real careful about that before we do away with something and do something different because a whole lot of people with a lot of wisdom before us did it this way. Maybe we need to learn from that first and then maybe we keep it, maybe we don't. So I think you have to have both the... Uh, the the uh, gospel uh, predominating and the humility to assess things and to also say, well, even if this person or this church isn't do doing it the, the way that I might prefer it to be done, well, they're not sinful in what they're doing. And so um, I, I really don't have a... a reason to be overly critical of this or to be critical at all. Okay, so um, so we kept uh, you know the order of scripture lessons right in the mass. What would we call that? The lectionary, right? So we still do the same readings you guys are doing. <laughs> um and the chief holy days, well, this is the one that cracks me up because even the churches that try to get rid of all of the stuff, when do they do Christmas? <laughs> December 25th. Why? Because that's when Christmas is. The church decided that a long time ago and it's been passed down and, um, well, they might not think they're following any kind of church here, but if they're following that... They are. Same thing with Easter, right? Okay. Uh, so the fathers knew of such freedom in human ceremonies. In the East, they kept Easter at another time uh, other uh, than at Rome. When the, it, by the way, this, this is still the case, isn't it? The East celebrates Christmas, or, well, uh, so it's uh, Easter at a different time than the West. Um, well, one of them's got to be wrong, right? <laughs> well, no. no, both are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Neither one of them's wrong. They're, they're both free to do that, right? So when the Romans accused the Eastern Church of schism, they were told by others that such practices do not need to be the same everywhere. Irenaeus says, diversity concerning fasting does not destroy the harmony of faith. And that's a great line right there, isn't it? Diversity concerning fasting, and fasting there would be representative of all of this stuff, right? Does not destroy the harmony of faith. Pope Gregory says that such diversity does not violate the unity of the church. 
In the Tripartite History, Book 9, many examples of different rites are gathered and the following statement is made. It was not the mind of the apostles to enact rules concerning holy days, but to preach godliness in a holy life. <laughs> so we don't care when you do it, but that you do it. Right? We don't care. Uh, all of the specifics don't have to be exactly the same everywhere, but that godliness and a holy life is preached. That's, that's important, right? So the gospel needs to be front and center. We don't care when you do it. There can be a whole lot of different ways of doing these things, but that these things are done is important. Okay. That's the, uh, that's the end of that. Uh, thoughts, comments, questions. So do you see, do you see the, the main thing here? Is Jesus in his finished work and justification by faith. Do you see how that permeates all of this? It, it's just, you can't miss it. And, and so when you have those things right, now you can understand things like fasting and, and how we worship and the freedoms that we have in all of these different things and, and not make rules where God has not made rules, right? The, the Roman Catholic Church had gotten in the habit of making rules where God had not made rules. We should never make rules where God has not made rules. And we should never do anything to obscure Jesus. He should be front and center. It should be, you know, first and foremost about him, what he's done for us, and the completed work that is now given to us as a gift. Right? By grace I'm saved, grace free and boundless. All right, anything, any thoughts, comments, questions? Yep. It seems like the default position, at least in the United States, amongst people that aren't Catholic, is to go the radical mm -hmm. form. Yeah. Saying, okay, we're pitching, it's either we're Catholic or we're pitching the opposite. All those things out. So, however, I think there's. Well, uh, part of it's culture. Part of it is um, <laughs> what Christianity developed as in the English-speaking world. And so Lutherans were kind of still catching up because <laughs> we were stuck in the German and, uh, and Finnish and uh, Swedish and all of those you know, languages. Uh, so, you, you know, you come over to the United States and, and we're kind of like in our, um, in our ghetto, right? Um, rather than having our voices really permeating the general conversation. So we're kind of behind. We're, we're playing catch up in that. Um, so that's a big part of it. Um, but you're seeing in, in recent times movement back towards oh oh we kind of messed up in getting rid of all of these things there, there's stuff there and we don't know necessarily what to do with all of this but we think we got to go back and recapture some of this so you're seeing that in in a lot of different ways in different churches and different movements um where you know a liturgy is developing a formal liturgy in a lot of churches that didn't have it before where they're like oh well maybe we should actually pray the lord's prayer um where they hadn't done that because it had been taught to them well that's just vain repetition it does it doesn't mean as much as if you really come up with something in your own heart um they're they're reintroducing creeds in some of these churches even um so you know there is movement uh, because I think there has been a recognition, uh, especially because the way that church became popular to do in the 90s and the early 2000s with the um, seeker-sensitive stuff and we're going to just 
uh, make it a, as appealing as possible and that will bring people in. What it ended up doing is it didn't bring new people to faith. It just shifted seats where people attended and the people that were in those churches weren't actually being discipled very well. They weren't uh, grounded in the faith and you have, you know, like uh, the, uh, the book by uh, Christian Smith where they're following these youth as they go through youth group and then they come into adulthood and uh, most of them leave the faith because they'd never actually learned the faith. They were never grounded in the faith. Uh, so I think there was a recognition. Um, we kind of messed up big time. We got to reassess. Yeah. Anything else tonight? All right, well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening, for the opportunity to gather, to study, and to be reminded of the, the great uh, salvation we have in Jesus, the great freedom we have in the gospel. And we ask that uh, you would keep us free from making laws where you have not made laws, and that we would never obscure the person and work of Jesus, but rather that we would magnify him, that we would... Uh, Put him first and foremost in all that we do uh, so that salvation by grace through faith in Jesus uh, can be heard and believed and consciences can be relieved and at peace uh, because of the cross of Christ. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.